Welcome to True Paranormal, the podcast with your host, Leo Rizzuti. Every week we will explore such topics as ghosts, demons, poltergeist, haunted history, time shifts, cryptozoology, and other aspects of the paranormal through listener-submitted accounts, documentary studies, and interviews with the investigators that dedicate their lives to searching for proof of the unknown. So get a fresh cup of coffee, dim the lights, relax, and get ready for a short visit to the realm of the true paranormal. Hi guys, Leo Rizzuti here. Welcome to another episode of True Paranormal, the podcast. It is a glorious time here in Cleveland, Ohio, where at least I am still reveling in the fact that my NC State Wolfpack just tore up the UNC Tar Heels in basketball. Ha ha ha. Take that, guys. I <laughs> uh, love it here whenever I can gloat over my buddies back home that are wearing the baby blue, which apparently is supposed to strike fear in the hearts of men everywhere. At any rate, guys, uh, we have got a jam-packed show for you tonight. We have got lots and lots of you folks sending in your stories to us, and we're going to share a few of them with you this evening. So buckle up, grab your coffee, sit back, and relax, and let's get on with our show. Our first story of the evening comes to us from a listener named Haruku, and Haruku has entitled it Demonic Entities. Okay, let's see what you sent us. Four years ago, I used to live with my parents, two sisters, and older brother in Northern California. That summer, my brother, Ken, was forced to marry his girlfriend because he got her pregnant. At the time, he was 19 and she was 17. In August of that same year, I decided to move to Wisconsin. After living in Wisconsin for two years, I received a phone call from my parents. They seemed distraught. I was informed by my parents that my brother's wife had left him and that in a state of despair he attempted to end his own life by drinking bleach. At the time, I was still in college and classes were still in session. However, seeing as this was a family emergency, I decided to take a week off. After the phone call, I booked a flight to California with my plane leaving the following day. When I arrived in California, I was somewhat dazed and drowsy from the long flight. However, I went to the hospital as quickly as possible to visit Ken. At the hospital, I waited in the lobby with my other relatives until we were permitted to see Ken, who was placed in the intensive care unit. Since only two people were allowed into the ICU at the time, I was one of the last to see my brother. When I was finally given the chance to see Ken, I headed towards his room with my father. This was around 12.30 at night. As soon as we rounded the corner in the hospital's hallway, I noticed a dark figure roughly three to four feet high enter into Ken's room. I thought nothing of it because I was tired, so I shrugged it off. In the ICU, I stared at my brother's almost lifeless body. My father was to my left. He tried hard to keep from crying. I, on the other hand, was too tired to feel anything. After five days of staying in the hospital, my brother was able to come back home. We were all glad to see him alive and doing relatively well. Once my seven days were up, off I went, back to Wisconsin. It wasn't until a little over a year after Ken's attempted suicide that I received another phone call from home. This time, it was my younger sister, who told me that my father had just had a heart attack. So once more, I booked another week-long trip to California. This time, I decided to bring along a friend of mine, since he had never been to California and wanted to tag along. Our plane landed in California at roughly 11 o'clock p.m., and my friend was exhausted from the trip, so we decided to go straight to bed instead of visiting my father at the hospital. That night, my friend and I slept on my parents' living room couches. At roughly 3 o'clock a.m., I was awakened by my friend calling out my name. Haruku, wake up. Since I'm a light sleeper, I woke up almost instantly. What's wrong? I asked. He replied, didn't you say that your brother, Ken, smokes? I answered, yes, he does. Whenever he needs to smoke, he'd go out in the garage and grab a cigarette. My friend paused for a few seconds and then said, well, I think I saw him go into the garage to smoke. You see, the thing is, I saw a dark, 
manly figure walk into the garage. At first I thought it was your brother, but then I never saw him come out. I thought he was just joking around, so I asked him, Okay, are you sure you weren't just dreaming? In a serious tone, he whispered, I'm not. I was wide awake when I saw what appeared to be your brother walking from the hallway into the garage, but he never turned on the lights and he never came back. I noticed the seriousness in his voice, so I got off the couch and proceeded towards the kitchen, where the garage door was located. After I turned on the kitchen lights, I noticed that the garage door was left open by as much as two inches. That sparked my curiosity since I distinctly recalled my mother having locked and closed the garage door before we all went to bed. I proceeded into the garage where I felt an icy, cold presence, even though it was a humid July night. Out of curiosity, I decided to touch the ashtray. Surprisingly, it was still quite warm. I concluded that it was indeed my brother Ken who decided to have a midnight cigarette before going to bed. I then talked my friend into going back to bed. The following day, I confronted Ken about the events that unfolded the night before. I asked him, So, did you get up for a cigarette last night at around 3 o'clock? He looked at me with an odd expression and said, No, I didn't. So then I asked, Did you smoke at all any time during the night? Ken answered, Yes, I did. I smoked a cigarette at nine last night just before going to bed. After hearing Ken's response, a cold chill ran down my back. If he last smoked at nine, the ashtray couldn't have stayed warm for six hours. We sat on the front porch, speechless for a few minutes. Then Ken said, Hey, I never told anyone this, but after my wife left me, I just kind of fell apart. I was really depressed, and I felt horrible. Then I started to hear some voices in my head, you know, telling me to kill myself. That's why I drank bleach. And the strangest thing happened to me while I was at the hospital. That night at the hospital, I saw you and Dad by my bed. I wanted to comfort Dad because he was going to cry, but I couldn't. There were these little black demons that just kept poking and prodding my body. Some of them were ripping off my flesh, and boy, did I smell bad. I also wanted you to help me out, but I just couldn't speak at all. It felt so horrible. Those five days of staying at the hospital were the worst days of my life. And by the way, thanks for coming to see me. His comments spooked me even more. As I recall, Ken was unconscious that night, so he couldn't have seen me nor our father. And yet, somehow, if he was dreaming, how could he have dreamed that both I and our father were by his side, and that our father was almost in tears? What scared me the most, though, was how I saw that shadowy figure enter the ICU that same night. Ken continued speaking. I still see them, too. I don't know what they are exactly, but every now and then I'd see a shadow darting across the hallway. Sometimes they would move fast, sometimes they'd move slow. They seemed to like the darkness, always heading towards dark spots in our house. It was then that I realized my friend wasn't dreaming, nor was it my brother who went out for a cigarette the previous night. Too scared and unable to fully comprehend what I was hearing, I went back inside and laid down on the couch. Once I soaked in what Ken had told me earlier, I came to this revelation. What if some people who commit suicide or homicide did so only because they were truly compelled by a greater force? I may never know for sure about this statement, but I do know that what I saw, what Ken saw, and what my friend saw were not normal shadows. Wow, Haruku, that is an absolutely amazing story. Thank you for sharing that with us. I have heard of several instances where negative entities have propelled people into trying to harm themselves. In fact, it is kind of a series whenever you're dealing with a negative entity that the first thing that they try to do is they try to get you to harm other people. And then their end game, a lot of times outside of possession, is to get you to harm yourself. So it sounds like that was exactly what was happening to your brother. I'm very glad to hear that he pulled through it, and hopefully he's doing a lot better with that. As far as the entities being attached to your house, 
that's a little disturbing and it may be something that down the road you might want to look at getting some help in there to get rid of those things if they are actually bothering people. Um, but at any rate, thank you for sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. Our next story comes from Mike in North Carolina, and he has entitled it House of Fire. Okay, Mike, I'm a North Carolina boy. I'm really interested to see what you sent us. When I was about seven or eight, my family moved to North Carolina, an area famous for ghosts. We moved into a modest two-story house that appeared normal from all aspects. Everything was great for the first couple of months until I started to realize that something about this place frightened me. At the head of the stairs, my father's bedroom door was to the right and mine was to the left. Even in the hottest weather, my father's bedroom was deathly cold. The first few events occurred in my bedroom. My grandfather worked at Duke University and would bring home tennis balls hit out of the court for our dog to play with. Our dog would, most annoyingly, play with these balls in my room late at night. As a means of stopping this, I would lock the balls, three of them, in my closet, which opened outward. The next morning, I would awake to find my dog playing with her three tennis balls, with the closet still closed. These events continued for a while, but came to a rather startling climax. One night, I once again locked the three tennis balls away. The next morning, I awoke to find our dog lying on a pile of what must have been 50 tennis balls. To this day, I still do not know where they came from. Amazingly enough, that was the most sane event in our house. I have already said my father's bedroom remained ungodly cold. In this bedroom, I could swear I heard voices, doors opening, and music, but I was too afraid to check. I asked some of our neighbors if they knew anything strange about our house. I was told that the lot that we had lived on had seen many different houses. Each one had burned to the ground a few years after it had been built. I came to find out that the first house built on the lot was burned down by the owner after his wife had died in childbirth. The final event I ever saw in the house occurred while my parents were at work. I was watching TV when my dog started to go crazy. I then heard what sounded like an agonizing scream and a loud thud coming from upstairs. I gathered enough nerve and walked upstairs. A faint odor of smoke was coming from my dad's bedroom and I looked in. Amazingly enough, my father's bed was resting on its headboard up against the wall. Once again, I smelled smoke. I grabbed my dog and went outside. About 10 minutes later, our house was burning to the ground. During the time it took for our house to burn, I constantly heard a scream inside of no. To this day, my parents think I burned down the house, but I know different. Whoa, Mike, that is an absolutely astounding story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I have heard of instances where houses built on lots continually burn down, and that sounds like exactly what you had there. It is a, an amazing artifact of the past that it keeps repeating and repeating and repeating itself. And I'd be curious to know if you guys rebuilt or if you just moved to another house. Let us know if you could. Thanks a lot for sharing your story with us. Our last story of the evening comes to us from Starchild, and she has titled it, Talking with the Spirits. Okay, Starchild, let's see what you have got for us. I'm a fourth generation daughter with the ability to see and speak with spirits still attached to this world. It's my gift and sometimes my curse. Over the course of my life, I have encountered quite a few spirits that have made a lasting impression on my life. Some good, others bad. Here are a few of the most memorable for me. The first time I remember seeing a ghost, I was only six or seven years old. I was on vacation with my family in the western part of Colorado. I wandered away from our campsite and became lost. I wandered for what seemed like hours before I heard a beautiful flute playing down by a stream. I followed the sound to a kindly old man who was dressed in buckskins and beads. Feathers hung from his gray hair. He was as real to me as anything I had ever seen before. It wasn't like popular movie views of a ghost. 
I could no more look through him than I can my own hand. After a short time, he stopped playing and turned to face me. He had sad eyes. I always remember his eyes. He smiled and asked me where my parents were. He said I should not be wandering away like that. He offered to take me back to my parents. He sang to me in his language as we walked through the woods. When we got back to camp, I called out to my parents, but as they turned around, I felt his hand let go of mine, and he was sort of fading away into just an outline. I knew then that the nice old man was a ghost. I wasn't afraid, though. The next memorable ghost that crossed into my life was not so kind-hearted. This spirit, I will refrain from using his name, use of the spirit's name I think only gives them power. I encountered through a Ouija board. I was enrolled in Catholic school at the time. The school itself had a harmless spirit of a little boy who had fallen into a well and died. To this day, he still resides there, but that is another story on its own. My classmates and I decided that we were going to try to speak to the little boy who was haunting our school using the Ouija board. It was not a very smart idea. We encountered a spirit who claimed that he was the little boy. He lied. He was a destructive and very evil entity. We took turns taking the Ouija board home with us as we had all chipped in to buy it. When it was my turn to have it for the week, the trouble really started. First, my bedroom began to grow cold and have a funny smell to it. Then objects would move around in my dresser. I started using the Ouija board more and more. I was falling into what is called progressive entrapment. When you use a Ouija board, you open a doorway within yourself and invite spirits into your body. After a while, the spirit can trick you into full possession. Before you know it, you have willingly let a spirit become part of you. This is what was happening with me. My personality was becoming altered. I was more of an angry, vengeful person as I took the spirit into me. Finally, I realized what was happening and went to the priest for our school. I told him what was going on. He demanded the Ouija board and I gave it to him willingly. He then set up a time with my mother to come and bless the apartment. When he got there that night, we opened the door to my bedroom to find it in chaos. The mattress of my bed was hovering upside down, yet perfectly made with the sheets and blankets. The air was cold and foul smelling, and there was a strange mist drifting around the bed. The priest sprinkled holy water and demanded that the entity leave. There was a great shriek and shaking of the room, and then everything was normal. It was a very scary experience, one that I should have learned from. To this day, I cannot touch a Ouija board. Every time I do, I connect with that same spirit. Only a few years ago did I have another occasion to use a Ouija board and found myself in the same situation, only a little more advanced. After writing myself into the spirit twice, I can assure you that it is not wise to reinvite a destructive spirit back into your life. It just gives them more power. That was not my final or most serious contact with an evil spirit. The worst event happened about five years ago, and to this day, I still have nightmares about it. My mother and I had moved into a house with one of her friends. We were going through some financial problems, and sharing rent was better than paying full rent. My mom's friend Karen had a daughter my own age, Kay, and we had the basement to ourselves, while our mothers had the upstairs. One night, I was woken from a deep sleep by a cold chill and the fact that someone had their hand on my leg and was slowly moving it to my thigh. I opened my eyes and saw a black, wavering mass over me. There was no real form to the entity. I started to scream, but a cold hand gripped my throat after the first weak shout escaped. A deep voice told me not to scream, that I was going to die. It said it had come to take me to hell. About this time, Kay had heard my weak cry and had come to see what was wrong. She said that she saw me about six inches off the bed, indentations on my neck like there was a hand there. She screamed and the entity flung me across the room with brutal force. The next day, my leg had deep scratches on it and my neck was badly bruised. The entity never came back and I never felt it in the house again. I didn't know what happened that night. Finally, to end this on a good note, I will tell you about the spirit I live with now. 
He is a very kind, protective spirit with a passion for stealing keys. Shortly after the incident explained above, I was out at the cemetery with a friend. I stumbled across this gravesite from the early 1800s. The stone was broken and covered with weeds. The inscription read, You shall not be forgotten. There was a deep sadness connected with the grave. I felt bad that there had been a promise made to this person, and it had been broken. I went out there almost every week, clearing the weeds and grass away from the stone, bringing flowers or other little gifts. It took the spirit six months to say something to me. It seemed it was afraid that if I knew he was there, I would stop coming. Before long, Eddie, as I came to call the spirit, was coming home with me. I took a chance inviting the spirit into my home. I was lucky. I wouldn't recommend anyone else doing it unless you are prepared for what could happen. Eddie has been a constant companion for these last few years. He has saved my life on two occasions. Once, I was supposed to be in a car that crashed and everyone died. He prevented me from going by hiding my own keys. If I had been able to drive to my friend's house to carpool over to that party, I surely would have been killed. Second, I had a man break into my apartment when I was living alone. I was getting out of the shower and heard someone in the apartment. Thinking it was my boyfriend, I continued to dry and dress, not worried. As I heard the footsteps coming towards the bathroom, the door slammed violently in the lock that can only be operated from the inside, turned. Next, I heard things flying around the apartment. There was a shrieking like I will never forget. It wasn't quite human. When the door unlocked, there was the would-be criminal, unconscious, and tied up with a phone cord. The apartment looked as clean and as intact as it had been when I got into the shower, despite the sounds of breaking dishes and glass and other noises. That was a fun one to explain to the police. I told them what happened. They didn't believe me until Eddie made his presence known by stealing the policeman's keys and then moving his notebook across the table. It was funny to see the look on their faces when that happened and when the keys just appeared out of thin air and dropped on the table in front of them. Eddie likes to play little pranks on my current boyfriend. He steals his keys quite often, especially if he thinks I'm upset with him. He is also known to move things away from me, like now, as I sit here typing, my glass of tea has moved from next to my keyboard to over by our fish tank, halfway across the room. Our animals and Eddie seem to get along just fine. Sometimes you can see invisible hands petting one of the cats or a dog toy rolling across the floor all on its own. I think we have spirits around us. It's just a matter of seeing and hearing them. All in all, you can't be afraid of them, not even the evil ones. You have to stand up for your space. You can offer to share it with those who are still earthbound, or you can demand that they leave. One way or the other, you have to understand that you are the dominant entity, and fear only gives them the power they need to control you. Wow, Starchild, that is possibly the wildest haunting story that I think I have ever encountered. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly about Ouija boards. They are not to be trifled with. Uh, it's not that Ouija boards in and of themselves are evil. They are simply a tool. They are a game. I mean, the Milton Bradley Company, I believe, invented them in the 30s. So it's not like they're the kind of thing that are in and of themselves evil. But the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of time, nothing good ever happens from them. You open yourself up to a world of contact and of entities that you wouldn't necessarily want around you all the time. And once they become attached, a lot of times, as you found, they're kind of hard to get rid of. So fortunately, you seem to have come out of the Ouija board aspect of that fairly well, even though you did have some terrifying encounters with some negative entities. And I know that can uh, that can be kind of scarring to a lot of people. So sounds like you came out of that well. It amazes me that after that aspect of the Ouija board incidents that you are still inviting spirits into your personal space. But hey, you know, if that is what you would like to do, then by all means, do that. It is a great thing that you have come into contact with a spirit that you consider friendly. And that is amazingly helpful. 
Uh, Eddie is kind of a neat spirit. I don't think that I have ever quite seen any kind of activity like you're describing from that with the poltergeist activity that results in someone being restrained in your home. That's kind of astounding. Now, uh, as far as the other thing, the warning about getting into the car or rather the stealing of the keys, that is something that we hear that every once in a while. I know my first wife, her mother and father lived in a home that was very haunted. They lived right across the street from a famous cemetery in Raleigh, and they had several incidences in there where the spirits that were in the home would contact them, and on more than one occasion, they had spirits wake them up because the house was catching fire and they were able to get the fire out and save themselves before anything happened. And they attributed that to the, the what they call friendly spirits of the Confederate ghosts in their house. So that is definitely something that we have seen before, and it's definitely a good thing. I'm glad that you are happy with Eddie in your life, and I hope that nothing negative ever happens from it. Again, thanks a lot for sharing your story with us. That was awesome. Well, guys, that's going to do it for this week's episode of True Paranormal, the podcast. I would like to thank Mike and Haruku and Starchild for sending in your stories. You guys absolutely rock. If you would like to share your stories with us, feel free to email it to us at trueparanormalpodcast at gmail.com. Also, look for us on Facebook at trueparanormal-thepodcast. And give us a like and feel free to message or email us from that site to get your story to us. And we'd be glad to share it on the air of one of our future broadcasts. Speaking of future broadcasts, next week I think we're going to be doing a very special episode. We are going to have a look at electronic voice phenomenon. That's right, EVPs. I have gotten a collection of EVPs from some folks that I have done some work with in the past and they have been gracious enough to share them with us and we're also going to look at the history of EVPs and what uh, what causes them some of the equipment that we can use to record them how you would go about analyzing EVPs and then also share with you what many consider to be the scariest EVP of all time oh and as a bonus I'm going to be sharing an EVP that I caught while recording this very podcast So you have that to look forward to, which is nice. At any rate, thanks again for listening to us this week and every week. If you listen to us on iTunes, be sure to give us a review and a rating and subscribe to us. That way we can help go up in the ranks and more people will become exposed to this and we'll grow as a community and we can do all kinds of great stuff. So if you could do that for us, that would be awesome. And again, if you... uh, catch us on facebook give us a like give us a shout out there and if you have any comments about the show that's a great place to put those comments that being said this is leo rizzuti saying thanks to you guys for joining us and check us out next week for another episode of true paranormal the podcast <laughs>